This is Dylan FM, the podcast that goes deep into the work and world of Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place with your host, Craig Danuloff. Johnny's in the basement mixing up the medicine. Those opening lines from subterranean homesick blues evoke a homemade science laboratory where ingredients known and unknown are being combined in ways that may or not be orthodoxed or officially approved. Perhaps this is why the Bob Dylan Center and curators and authors Mark Davidson and Parker Fischel chose the title Mixing Up the Medicine to name the first official book from the Bob Dylan Center and the Bob Dylan Archives. As you'll hear in today's conversation, these two have been in the laboratory, choosing between and mixing together all kinds of things, known and unknown, into something very rare indeed, a Bob Dylan book that's unlike all the rest. The magic, of course, is the Dylan Archives. Mark and Parker were working from the inside, with a collection that started from 100,000 items that Bob Dylan and his office saved over the past 60 years, and which has grown rather significantly since the first batch arrived in Tulsa through massive donations from top Dylan collectors around the world and acquisitions they've made on the open market. Mark is the Senior Director of Archives and Exhibitions for both the Bob Dylan Center and the Woody Guthrie Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Parker is an archivist who served as the co-creator of the inaugural exhibitions at the Bob Dylan Center. Mark has a PhD in musicology, and Parker has done archival consulting and production work for Thurn Band Records, Sony, and others. And not only are they trained and experienced professionals, as you'll hear today, they're huge deep dive Bob Dylan fans, which shows through in the care and detail and the passion that just drips from every page of this book as it does from every inch of the Bob Dylan Center. If you haven't yet heard our episode on the Bob Dylan Center, the magnificent Bob Dylan Center, please check out Season 2, Episode 7. I talked with Center Director Steve Jenkins on an interview I did while visiting there on the occasion of their first anniversary. There's a link in the show notes. I love this book, as you're going to hear in this interview. You'll learn a ton more about it in this talk, and because I knew our partner over at Pod Dylan was also interviewing Mark and Parker, I tried to ensure there wasn't too much overlap by focusing on my favorite specific items in the book and taking advantage of the opportunity to ask about what else we all may see from the archives in the future. So enjoy this episode, but you'll also want to check out the Pod Dylan show for a different take and talk about this new book. I'll include a link in the show notes. Also there, you can find a link to our Substack and blog, where we've got a full review of the book, more photos, and a video tour. If you're hearing this, you're listening to our public feed. There's an extended version of this episode, they're usually at least twice as long, available for FM Plus and premium subscribers. You can subscribe right now in Apple Podcasts or at fmpods.com. You'll get the extended versions and bonus episodes of not only this show, but all the shows in the FM Podcast Network, which includes Bob Dylan, The Dylan Taunts, and more. We have no ads in these episodes, and our subscribers and members make this show possible. If you can join us, you'll get a lot, and your support will be appreciated. Now, here's our conversation with Mark Davison and Parker Fischel, authors of Mixing Up the Medicine from the Bob Dylan Center and archives. Welcome to Mark Davidson and Parker Fischel from the Bob Dylan Center, who have put together uh, the primary authors and curators and creators of this amazing new book, Mixing Up the Medicine. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Craig. I was able to see you guys last week out in Bridge Hampton and more importantly, uh, paw through the book quite a few times. Anyway, you know, I, I think this book is just unbelievable. And I, and I know from talking to Mark in the past and from reading about it, that this is a many years in development work. 
And, and I really feel like you've given everyone a take home version of the archive, which is kind of more than any of us could have ever, ever hoped for. What I'd like to start on today is talking about the archive itself, because I know, Mark, you've been there essentially from the beginning. And Parker, I know you've got a couple of years in. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you guys think about the archive now and how that's evolved, essentially getting your head around what's there and understanding what it is and how you approach it. You had that archive and you had X amount of pages to fit it in. How did you think about the archive you had and what was the goal in translating it or some of it or elements of it into this book? The archive is daunting. It's enormous for the 60 plus years still going of, um, you know, creative work that Bob Dylan has created and is creating. It's a, it's an enormous amount of paper trail, tape trail, film trail, video trail, just about everything trail that he has left behind that will literally, you know, will all still be sifting through it and making the connections, you know, long after we're all gone, probably. Uh, It's that rich, that dense, and it reflects, you know, such an enormous, obviously, an impulse to create a serious work ethic, judicious self-editing, all those things. And so it's a lot to wrap one's head around and you just kind of have to start in one place and and do your best. And so um, in the creation of this book, we had a good template in that we had just sort of finished the center. So we were able to leverage a lot of the work that had gone into that to sort of have a core to work around. And we also had the benefit where uh, Michael Chaikin, the former curator of the Bob Dylan Archive, and his colleague Robert Polito, poet and professor at the New School in New York City, had commissioned all of these wonderful essays that sort of are sprinkled throughout the book. So we had sort of two building blocks. You know, I said the material from the center kind of provided a core, and we had a lot left over that we couldn't fit into the center as uh, I know you've been there, but for others who haven't, it's, it's chock full, you know, hopefully if you go there, you find the same sort of tangled web of, of, you know, connections and, and make your way through it in sort of a similar way. But um, yeah, so we had that, uh, we had a lot left over. We also had this uh, in the Bob Dylan center, there's an archive wall, which is sort of the approach that we took to the book, which is, that there are objects that allow you to dive into episodes or concepts or themes that are either unique to one sort of part of Dylan's career, like a historical event, or that um, go across several eras or, or his entire career. And so that was sort of another building block. So anyway, we had all this at our hand and we just kind of went through all of the, you know, every single sheet of paper, every single photo several times and pulled big, enormous buckets of things that interested us. And, you know, the more we went back, the more, especially with that intensive eye to kind of crafting these vignettes, the more we saw how things fit together. We discovered, you know, we're able to say, oh my goodness, this is this, or this relates to that in really sort of um, surprising and compelling ways. And so that's what I mean when I say that people will be pouring over this and finding new, uh, new discoveries far into the future. And this is just, I think, uh, a starting point. Was there any sense of this is a representation of the archive versus, you know, you, you use the, I think the nine sections, I think the, I believe it's Sean Melens came up with those nine uh, time frames that are used in the, the Columbia gallery. And that's, I believe let's mirror the structure of the, of the breakdown of the book. The, the nine eras that we have downstairs at the Dillon center in the Columbia records gallery, those were fought over a lot by a number of us uh, to come up with what are good ways to digest a career that, you know, dates back to the early sixties earlier in a way that, somebody who didn't know very much about Dylan, Dylan at all could get a sense of what was going on. Um, where do I start? How do I digest this? We took that approach for the book with some tweaks. I think our, our years shifted a little bit, our, our, our thinking shifted a little bit. Um, and it was partially due to new conversations that we had been having 
but also because uh, of the stories that the book told in a certain way uh, that um, that we, you know, as Parker said, we were digging through and finding all these connections and just thought, well, this is the way this has to be. The, the other factor in all that is, uh, Parker had mentioned, the archive arrived in Tulsa in 2016, and Michael Chaikin and Robert Polito soon thereafter started bringing people to Tulsa to uh, take a look at it and, and dig through and find something that was of interest to them. And then, then they you know, asked them to write an essay about it. And those essays really became the sort of the core of the book that we had initially been thinking about. So part of our way of dividing up the book was also chronologically, you know, these essays definitely will fit here, even if they're not, you know, talking about 1965 or 66, that, that was also a consideration. So we were working on a, a few different levels there. The essays, I got to say, are just fantastic. So many of them really are revealing and interesting, either either uncoveries or new ways of thinking about something. You know, we, we've all read a hundred Dylan books, and a lot of these, even the episodes, have been gone over in, in various ways. But you know, sometimes because of the archive material, sometimes that you know the the essayist is really talking about what they saw and telling us things that either they didn't know before and or you know, at least we didn't know before. And in some cases, just who they were and the kind of thinking and writing they, they could bring to it. But they're, they really are not superfluous. And so I'm not at all surprised to hear you say to some degree, they're structurally part of the, the way you, you thought about the framing the whole book, because they're, they're really amazing. I, I made it about halfway through in detail, where I feel like I've really read every word and every, every essay. And I can't wait to get to the rest. I'm very interested to go back, Mark, and see the shifts you made in the uh, in the nine designations. I would just say one additional guiding concept, something we took from the center, the multiplicity of voices. So like we all, like you said, have read a million Dylan books and um, we felt like Dylan's story is best told almost like the Todd Haynes, right? Through like all these different voices. And so the essays contribute that. Mark and I wrote these long captions that sort of illuminate each episode and, and set of images, but also we drew in as much as possible from the raw interviews that were done from No Direction Home, which are part of the Bob Dylan archive. The Bob Dylan Center has been doing these wonderful interviews with various people who have direct and not so direct connections to Dylan. And so we, you know, we pulled from those as well. I think they all help showcase different dimensions that point out things that any one person wouldn't be able to see, right? Griffin and Dace sees all these things because of what he brings to the table that I would have, you know, no basis in because I haven't read Conrad's Victory. So yeah, I think that's a really important way about also how we approach the book. I was thinking this morning that all of Dylan's work, you know, we've all learned it takes years sometimes to digest it, or at least you'll have a very different view of it. 10 or 20 or 40 years after the fact. But sometimes, especially now with the archives and the bootleg series and all the reissues, things come at us, and as long as the new things, so fast that it's hard to give them the time, each one, the time you know that it needs. And Philosophy of Modern Song was, was one that I spent a fair amount of time on and could imagine you know, hundreds more hours in terms of conversations and, and things that are in there and just to stop and think about it. And your book is, I think, the biggest of them all. It's kind of a fun book. You can leaf through it. You know, it's very immediate gratification because there's so many killer visuals and nothing's thick and heavy. And even the essays at most seem like they're four pages. You know, maybe there's one or two that go a little bit longer. So you can kind of dip in and out and so forth. But the the depth or the opportunity for depth that's there and focusing on kind of every little thing is really, you know, as good. I made a list. You were just talking about the parts that are there and I was trying to understand it. And there's, so there's the photos and there are so many killer photos that <laughs> my notes are like bullet, bullet, bullet of the things I thought were new or exceptional. And I just have this photo name. Wow. Photo name. Wow. And I wound up with this, I couldn't believe how long it was getting of these incredible photos that I had not seen. So there's the photos, there's the memorabilia 
fun stuff, record covers, posters, that kind of thing. The, the manuscripts, the lyrics, which is another incredible dive. And it, it occurred to me today that Dylan's, Dylan's writing is like perfect Dylan, which is you kind of can't make it out. So it, it, it seems like a blur, you know, like listening to a song in the background. But if you go and super focus, it's, you, you know, every line or often there's just these holy cow things in there. Then there's the essays, then there's your text, and then there's kind of the event structure that you built it around. And that really is a lot of things coming at a user. And they don't feel it, but I'm saying it's this multiplicity of, of things going on that are really worth exploring. So just hats off to you guys for figuring out how to architect and shoehorn in so much, you know, so many great things. Well, let's talk about, well, let's go into a little bit. So I didn't start making this list of my favorite things. I thought that would be a fun way to to go through this, the stuff that kind of su surprised me in the book. Well, here's one. The Johnny Cash letter about train of love. And you had a couple of pages about the Johnny Cash relationship. And that there's a letter that Johnny wrote to Bob after the performance that we've all seen of, of Bob doing train of love in the 99, I think, at the Hammerstein Ballroom. Anything else about the, the Cash relationship or, or that little, little vignette that you guys uh, want to want to share more on? Yeah, I love that section too. Um, I love it because for a number of reasons, mostly because um, of what a warm sort of relationship that they seem to have had from what we have available to us. And I knew as I saw as I was reading through the the letter that's on the opening spread that talks about Mother Maybell loving um, Restless Farewell. That like that was the one I wanted to use because like how cool is that, right? And I loved the way in which. Prior to anybody having these access to these letters that Johnny was writing to Bob, and so you can kind of glean what was going back and forth, that like the story they told lined up, right? They were writing these letters, and then they finally get to meet, and it's this like ecstatic moment. Um, so I thought, you know, that's a really amazing thing as well. And then, yeah, when I was just talking about like how people will continue to find things in the archive forever, so it was like pretty deep into the book we had that scrap of paper that Johnny um, Cash scribbled his address on, that was part of the scraps of paper found in Dylan's oh, a wallet that had come to the archive that's on display in the center that also had Otis Redding's business card and it had contact information for the poet um, Adrian Rawlings and Bjorn, the photographer Bjorn Larson Ask and what's her name, Annette Kullenberg from ID Magazine. So it, you could kind of date it to about 1966, right? And then that's Johnny Cash scribbled down address was part of that. So we could kind of associate it, but then I looked for that address and it's like, oh yeah, he lived there. That's the address where he lived with Waylon Jennings for like one year. When you think about that, it adds a whole other dimension to this little, you know, quickly scrawled address on a, you know, strip of paper that got thrown into a wallet, which got thrown into, you know, presumably a box and sat around until it ended up at the Bob Dylan Center. And so I think that's like the level of details that people will continue to sort of pull from the archive that will make the, enrich the whole story for years to come. That whole thread of, I mean, there's a lot of Bob's work and a lot of his professional life and all kinds of incidents we know about that obviously take up a lot of the book, but these little bits of behind the curtain, you know, private life and the unfinished letters are part of it. They both, in both directions, I think are great, but these little things where you kind of say, Oh, that's just something that Bob was doing or was happening to Bob or someone said to him. It's really an interesting, incredible insight that we really rarely have obviously ever gotten before. So it really adds a, a shape to this. I'll ask you about two other letters that are, I think close after the, the Johnny one. One is the Paul Williams letter. I'm so happy you have the essay about Paul. I'm a, a huge Paul Williams fan, as as a lot of hardcore folks are. And it's just beautiful that Clinton wrote that and that you included it in the book. But shocking that there's, and I'll let you tell about it, a piece of a letter Bob was writing to Paul that was apparently never sent. Yeah. You know, Clinton's Clinton's essay about that is is incredible and really fitting that that he's the one to take that on. Yeah, that is one of only a couple of letters that we have unsent in the archive, partially because just not a lot of letters from 
Dylan to others uh, just exist. We, the archive has a lot of letters to Bob from various people from, you know, across the years, but just not a lot exist going out. So that's pretty, pretty incredible. And the, um, the letter to Allen Ginsberg as well that we've got in, in there is, is another one of those unsent letters that, uh, from, from around that same time period that are pretty fantastic. I just wanted to point out that the reason they were never sent is because they were never finished. Those are, you know, they're like, they trail off and he's moving on to the next thought. So um, there's a reason that, you know, they stuck around. Yeah. And there's a great letter from Ginsburg back to Dylan. I think it's 69. He asked Bob what his best verse was. And he came back and says to live outside the law, you must be honest. And, And this other quip about Dylan saying, Ginsburg and some of his poet friends had looked hard at Dylan's work and assessed that one out of every four lines was great. Yeah. And Dylan said he was trying to up his quota, his percentage. Yeah, that's from the No Direction Home interview with with Ginsburg. And there's so much rich detail. I mean, I love the detail that we pulled out about how, um, you know, Kerouac was a fan. I don't think I'd ever heard that before, um, though I'm sure, you know, people who are maybe it's something that Ginsburg may have said multiple times but also i never knew the detail that ginsburg had um you know tried to get william burroughs on as part of the rolling thunder review i think that's you know another sort of one of those details that's like wow you know what would that have been like what role would william burroughs have found himself in you know in that situation and a fan a hardcore fan can kind of leave through and go you know know about it know about it know about it because we have seen the incidents, but you know the Archibald McLeish thing, or Fred yeah. Getty at City Lights, or George Harrison in Woodstock, are all those are three I put in a list here, and I know there's many, many more where we knew about it, but you guys come with literally the receipts. You know, there's a letter, there's a photo, there's a detail that wasn't there before, and that the difference is is often enormous because you reveal something like there's that I don't know whose essay it is about Hazel or not about Hazel about um, Dirge. Dirge, yeah, Raymond Foy. The Dirge it's, essay is unbelievable. It's a really amazing one. Yeah, where where he uncovered all these things we didn't know and maybe potential meanings and other references that got left out. It, it, it's just so, so incredibly enlightening. Let's talk about the photos for a minute. The book is full of incredible photos of a guy who we've all seen, a ton of incredible photos. How it would seem that editing and that curation on your guys' part would have been as hard as anything else here. Cause I know there are just tens of thousands and you've got a guy who seemingly has been around every good photographer in the world at the right time in his life and never walks in a room and doesn't get photographed. So there's no, literally no shortage of material and somehow looks good in every goddamn one of them, which is, you know, good for him, but amazing. Oh, Mark's got some exceptions. No, I, I um, agree. I, I agree. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, tell me about curating the photos because it's a it's a huge part of this book. And they're, you know, to wow, you know, I'm just representative, but to wow someone who's leafed through 100 million Dylan pages before. So here's here's some of my wows. I got the list open here. So the uh, oh, the the pet. This is on the memorabilia. Pat Garrett Spanish lobby card. Like I want a six foot poster of that. It's just gorgeous. That there's a photo at the other end. Uh, I didn't write down what's in it, but it's great. The full, full Blood on the Tracks cover photo. I've seen, I knew it was an enlargement of his head, but I'd never seen the full wide frame foot to head. And it's a beautiful photo in and of itself. Oh, yeah. The world of John Hammond, where you see John Hammond with Bob in the background. I mean, anyway, I could go on all day, but I'm just saying, A, you're going to blow away all the fans with what's in there. Tell me how you curated photos. One of the first things that I did, that Parker and I did, was to get a bunch, 160 or so binders of photos digitized and something like 10,000 images. It was more than that. All right. Way more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, getting the, the files back and just going, oh gosh, this is, we would have to hire a dozen people for you know, a hundred years to go through and just identify people. And so we had a lot to work with. One of the nice things is that with a framework like the one that we had, segments of of Dylan's life, stories we wanted to tell, that sort of, it allowed us to, to winnow down pretty 
quickly. There were instances, no doubt, where the photos, you know, were the reason for the season. And, and they sort of, from the photo came the story. I'm certain, Parker, that you have some thoughts on some of the photos you chose. We tried to, in, certainly many of these photos will be familiar. You know, there are iconic Dylan images that are iconic for a reason. And those, for someone who is not as well-versed in Bob Dylan as the three of us, you know, are something that ground them in the book and, and give them something to hold on to as they sort of move through. So uh, those are there and they're great. And I think in this context, it shows like how great they are. Um, but then, if, you know, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we had access not only to the amazing holdings of the Bob Dylan archive, but I'll say that like Sony Music has been a, a great partner in the Bob Dylan Center and in this book project. And they early on in the archive's existence provided a set of, of their photo archive, their Bob Dylan photo archive to um, the Bob Dylan archive. And so we had all of those to pour through as well. And so like it runs the gamut from like a beautiful Ro Richard Avedon photo to um, I was going through the photos from town hall that Don Hunstein had taken. And I noticed there's this photo of blurry. So there's no reason anyone would have ever used it, but there's a photo of Bob, you know, Dylan walking off stage with papers in his hand, presumably at the end of the town hall concert, he, for the first and last time he publicly kind of performs this piece of prose called last thoughts on Woody Guthrie. And presumably, those are the sheets of paper he has in his hands. And then, you know, the archive has not those sheets, but a, a later sort of typescript of the speech. But we were able to sort of pair those. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, we didn't. sometimes it's a beautiful image for a beautiful image sake, and it carries the weight. And sometimes it's because it connected with objects or other artifacts in the archive. And it could, you know, that makes a story come alive. So we tried to hit both ends of the spectrum. And then there's a lot of in between. Another great one is like, um, you know, there's a W Eugene Smith photograph of, um, Dylan at, uh, Columbia recording studios in New York city, the day he's recording like a rolling stone and he's standing next to his then manager, Albert Grossman looking, pouring over the back of a copy of the birds, Mr. Tambourine man in advance of that, you know, and like, the W. Eugene Smith, I mean, he's an incredible photographer, um, you know, and so it felt a little bit gratuitous to sort of use a documentary image, so to speak, of his. But, um, but you know, pairing that with the photo of press photo of, of Dylan at Ciro's in Los Angeles and the nobody sings Dylan like Dylan. And then, you know, like I said, we had this like big bucket. So we had all kinds of other things that we had to cut in order to like focus in those three and bring it together. But that allowed us to sort of tell the story of Dylan and the birds and sort of how, you know, cover songs remain this sort of vital um, outlet for his songs in that period and beyond. There's one other instance in the book, the credit goes to Parker on this one, where we found, uh, and there are some instances throughout the archive of this, he found a picture a photo by uh, Daniel Kramer of those sessions for like a Rolling Stone. And, and you see a manuscript flipped over. And because we have the actual manuscript, we know that it's the, the unfinished song Mavis manuscript. So uh, we were able to tell that story with a, a scan of the manuscript. Would you like a copy of Mixing Up the Medicine? Well, we're giving one away. Every subscriber or member of Dylan FM is eligible. If you get our seven days weekly newsletter, you're already entered to win. If you don't, head over to thefm.substack.com and become a free or paid subscriber. On October 30th, 2023, we'll choose one subscriber at random and send a free copy of this $100 book. It's amazing as you're hearing about, and we're glad to give one away. To hear the rest of our discussion about mixing up the medicine, become an FM Plus or Premium subscriber. Sign up in Apple Podcasts or at fmpods.com. Subscribers get extended editions plus bonus episodes of every one of our shows, plus those of Pod Dylan, The Dylan Taunts, and all the FM Podcast Network shows.
It's just $4.99 a month, and subscriptions make these shows possible. Did you enjoy this show? Then please rate this podcast and leave a review. It really helps. And take a moment to follow this podcast so you don't miss upcoming episodes. Thanks for listening.